So let's jump right into it. I, uh, I'm going to allow, allow each of these folks to introduce themselves. And I gave them a couple of questions and um, allowed them to sort of just share their story. And, and it's going to be so exciting to, to interact with that because the questions I gave them were, we have a thing in our community called prouds and sorries. And where you share stuff you're proud of and you share stuff that you sort of lament. And so I asked them to share something that they're proud of within the church and within CCDA or something that they're sort of lamenting and struggling with within the church and CCDA. Uh, or they could also share, looking at a key component of CCDA, they could either nuance one or sort of critique one or celebrate one. So basically it's, it's free game and they're going to each share a little bit and then we'll open it up for dialogue. Kalila. Good morning. My name is Kalila Worland, and I'm the lead organizer at Bethel New Life. And first, I would just like to give honor and praise to God for seeing the very many faces of colors and ages and just just the holistic approach that we're supposed to get at CCDA. And I just would like to give honor and praise to God first. So if you can join me in the applause. Thank you. Well, coming from a family with two social service workers, service was always something that was instilled in our home from our mom and dad, even in our small apartment in the low-income housing projects of Cleveland, Ohio, where they continue to still live and encourage other young adults as well as older people in their own generation to not only leave, but to come back and bring back what you've learned and to try to instill in young adults the fact that you don't have the structured family in those type of areas. And to leave that, you're basically setting up a disaster for the next generation. So my parents are very uh, proud of the work that I do, but I'm more so proud to be able to understand why they did it. Um, I went away to school in Nashville, Tennessee, where I thought I could make my biggest impact by becoming a political organizer. But what I did learn was that I wanted to give the gratification that I gave to one candidate to a community. Let them feel what it's like to win, mm -hmm. to be in power, to feel and steal, to have a group rally behind them with signs and standing with them in their struggle. And it taught me a lot about listening. Because one thing I think leaders forget is that they are listeners first. You can have the ideas and you can have the vocal ability to speak, but until people speak to you and they see that you trust them and they see that you're going to stand behind them, only then will they allow you to lead. And that teaches you a lot about yourself. And sometimes people get caught up in what they're doing and how they're feeling and you don't realize that there's someone ten times worse or even ten times better. But if only you would have listened, you would have learned a lot more. And so the one thing that I'm proud of about CCDA, I was here last year in Indianapolis, my first CCDA experience and only being an organizer for a year at Bethel, was that there's call to action at CCDA. So even the work that you're thinking that you're doing is so great, you have to put that action behind it. And so at the last night we stood here and we heard Jim Wallace and everybody was all wrapped up and Everybody just felt the passion and then he said, aha, now it's time for action. I want to see how many people will come up here and sign up to go to D.C. and take the risk of being arrested and telling our legislators that your budget is a moral document. Where you put your money is where your heart lies. And although I didn't hear the arrested part, <laughs> I knew as a young adult that where I put my money was where my heart lies, and I looked at my checkbook, and I said, wow, if my federal government do what I do with my checkbook, our nation is in trouble. And we have to stand up, and we have to band together to do that. And when I went to D.C., and I seen those same committed faces that came and they signed up, and those same committed faces that were singing and praising on the stairs, and those same committed faces that was with their hands behind their back but still thanking God for being a part of this process, it made me feel like I'm a part of a world that gets it, even if it's just for that one day. We've seen police officers, the very police officers that's having the same problems connecting with residents in a community with police brutality being a high impact, especially in Chicago. 
Were the very police officers asking me that I want them to hold my Bible? Was I comfortable with them? Was I comfortable when the handcuffs? So at that moment, it felt like utopia because I know no other day I would have experienced that on the west side streets of Chicago. But those officers got it that day. And some of them were just so shocked and amazed and they're whispering in their ear, thank you for doing this. I wish I could, but I'm glad you were doing it. And that was a proud moment. And to see them walking and seeing Dr. John Perkins get up and get arrested and just the class from the people in D.C. There were people lined up as we were walking through with the police officers clapping and patting us on the back. And that's something that you don't get every day in this work. Sometimes you don't get a clap. Sometimes you don't get a thank you. But when you get it, you're appreciative. And then you realize that God be the glory mm -hmm. and that we're doing God's work. And that's the reason why the eight components, I can't just pick one, Shane. I'm sorry. I was thinking in my mind, one component, one component. I try to live my life, and I'm blessed to be at an organization at Bethel that believes in those eight components, but not only believe it, but hold us accountable for following through those components. And I'm grateful to be a part of a great team of outreach organizers that go out into the community, find out what they want, listen to their needs, and then connect them to the resources that they want. So this has been a grateful experience. This is my second year. I'm looking forward to my 15th, 20th, 30th year being a part of CCDA, and I'm just blessed to be a part of this panel, this great panel of great leaders. Thank you. Amen. <laughs> Good afternoon. My name is Tally Hairston, and I am the director of the John Perkins Center at Seattle Pacific University in Seattle, Washington. Uh, the Perkins Center is a partnership between John Perkins, the Christian community and, and organization, uh, churches and organizations in, in our city, and uh, Seattle Pacific University, a Christian college there. Located right on the other side of downtown, on the, on the uh, nice side of downtown. I uh, have been in CCD ministry for 10 years now. I also am an associate pastor of a diverse, urban, inner city, whatever you want to tag it today, uh, congregation. Uh, it, forgive, I'm also Pentecostal, so forgive me if I start speaking in tongues. <laughs> I'll try to contain myself. <laughs> it is um, fun to be here. It's always exciting to come to CCDA. Uh, one of the things that, when Shane talked to me about this, is that okay? One of the things that um, came to my mind immediately was the, um, the frust growing frustration that I'm experiencing in working with ur uh, suburban churches. Uh, there is a growing frustration and uncomfortability in the suburban churches that we're working with both in the region, in locally in Seattle, but also within the region. And I think that's pretty cool. With all the resources and wealth and the, the great diversity switch that's happening with gentrification, we're getting more calls from suburban churches saying, help us. I think that's something to be excited about. For years, many of us have worked and been mentored by great urban indigenous leaders but no one called on us for the answers. And we worked a lot in anonymity. Now today, it, 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 it is exciting to see urban indigenous leaders being called to train, to teach, to advise, to give counsel, not just to local churches, but to Christian schools in the suburban neighborhoods in places like Chicago and Atlanta and New York where you're seeing gentrification happen, we're also seeing the cry from those churches to say there's got to be a way in which you all have, what you have learned, tell us. And that's, that's an, an opportunity for emerging leaders like, like those in this room and those on this panel, uh, a wonderful opportunity to become the global urban leaders that God has called us to. Something our forefathers and mothers hoped for. And they worked hard for us to be able to work at a Seattle Pacific University. 
to work at World Visions, to work at the Young Lives, to take positions in places that they couldn't take, to become missions leaders in these suburban churches as the diversity, economic and racial and cultural, move to their neighborhoods. I think it's an opportunity and a platform that, as an emerging leader, at times feels like an awesome responsibility and a great challenge. But at most times, I wake up in the morning and I go, thank God. Thank God that the work that those who have gone before me has, has proven out in CCDA ministry and CCD work. It's proven out that we can change neighborhoods for the glory of God. Not just that they can have new paint and new buildings, but they, that they can have a new spirit and a new ethos about them. Mm -hmm. I think it's a wonderful platform, but it is also something that, um, it, it's a two-edged sword in my opinion. It's something that we can, I can also see something there that is, is, is worth lamenting over. Uh, as we get these platforms, you and urban indigenous emerging leaders, it's important that we not forget someone sacrificed to give us that platform. And that too, we now have to sacrifice and not maintain the platform as our own. The platform was not just for us. It was for those who would come behind us as well. And though we hold positions and organizations that are funded to the tune of a million dollars or to 500,000 or 200, we cannot allow ourselves to forget that someone sacrificed for us and for those coming after us. It would be real easy for me to say, well, I've got mine. I'm an emerging leader. But we've got to go after the young kids in our community, and I think Phil Jackson is a great example of that. Do it in their context, do it in their, in, in their mode, in their philosophy, in their, in their culture. And not be afraid to turn down those large payday speaking obligations uh -huh. to spend time with the folk who made you. Uh -huh. And I have to do that every day, so I'm, I'm, not, you know, I'm not talking out of both sides of my mouth here. And it's hard. But it's something we've got to do to guarantee that the future we have is made available to us, to the young people that are watching us. I think CCDA is positioned perfectly, not just in its eight uh, 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 philosophies, its eight, eight focuses of ministry, but it's also positioned, in my opinion, structurally for an organic movement of God. Many times we run into organizations that want to institutionalize themselves and never see change because they've made it. What I feel and see within CCDA is a sense of organic movement that says if God decided that we should flip the script, we will not lose who we are. We will not lose our core. We will not lose our identity. But we're going to move with the Spirit of God. Yes. Call it my Pentecostal <laughs> stuff. <Go ahead. laughs> Call it what, it what it is. But the movement of God to say, today we did it this way. Tomorrow we're going to do it this way. Not just change for change's sake, but because emerging leaders that you see on this panel and those emerging leaders in the audience and that you work with in your neighborhoods are uniquely equipped to move with the organic move of God. They're in a world where culture changes daily and they don't fear change. And CCDA can continue to provide leadership for them if CCDA continues to be an organic movement of God. Thank you. Good morning. My name's Jonathan. I'm from the Root Ba House in Durham, North Carolina. Thank you, Kiana. Uh, but uh, Kiana's from Walltown. I'm, I'm not. Um, I grew up in uh, rural North Carolina, a little tobacco community called King. Uh, and I, I grew up with the Southern Baptists. I, I don't know if you all know much about the Southern Baptists, but um, 150 years ago, we distinguished ourselves from other Baptists by saying we wanted to keep our slaves. Um, I, didn't, I didn't know that growing up. All I knew was the 
sweet old ladies that uh, told me Jesus loved me and made me memorize scripture. Uh, but as I, I grew up, um, I, I heard the gospel preached by a fellow named William Barber. Um, he's a black man, and he preached like no one I'd ever heard before. Um, and I, I thought he was so good that I invited him to come up and, and preach um, at, at my church. And when he came, he brought his, uh, he brought his brother with him uh, and told me that um, he had to do that because he knew that uh, he was coming to clan country, and he wasn't sure he'd be safe. And that's when I learned uh, that I was a racist and didn't know it. So uh, the thing that I love about CCDA is that there's a space in the church in America where I can go and there are white folks and black folks and everybody in between uh, worshiping God together. Uh, Here's why I say white, black, and everybody in between. Uh, I believe in the United States what racism means is that there was a color cast spectrum that was developed that goes from white to black and everybody who comes to this country gets mapped onto that spectrum and here's here's what runs along with the spectrum white means good and black means bad and the reason I think CCDA has such a gift to give to the church is because John Perkins has modeled a kind of leadership that shows how a black man in the church can choose to follow Jesus and model for us what greatness means. Here's, here's the eighth part of leadership that, that, that JP didn't say this morning, that leaders model the kind of greatness that they're teaching people to, to pursue. And Jesus said, yeah, you can clap, it's, it's a good thing. <laughs> You know, those two guys came to Jesus, the disciples, they said, we want to be great. Young folks want to do that. They want to be great. And Jesus said, well, if if you want to be great, here's how you do it. You need to become the least, the last, and become the servant of all. I think it's, it's a miraculous thing how that's been modeled here in CCDA. It's, it's not that big a deal that somebody like me moves into the city. Sociologists can explain why a white guy like me would move into the city. But here's, here's the big deal. The big deal is that John Perkins, who made it out of Mississippi, went back. That's, that's something that only the gospel can explain. And, and I believe that's the basis of the reconciliation that's been modeled here in CCDA. So here's the challenge. I think the, the challenge that we face is that there's a kind of reconciliation that's become somewhat popular. Um, I, I call it the language of multiculturalism. I believe multiculturalism is, is this conviction, the conviction that no matter what the color of your skin is, you can become white. <laughs> multiculturalism is rooted in, in the same logic that gave rise to race. We all need to know this. The idea of race is only 500 years old. It got invented by some white guys in Europe. They, they, they created the idea that the color of your skin has something to do with your identity. It didn't exist before that. But the same people, the same people dreamed the idea of multiculturalism. They said if each culture contributes their part to the great human race, then we will emerge with, with the superhuman race in the end. That was Kant's vision. But the superhuman race that gets imagined in multiculturalism is always white. It always wants the things that white folks have. It's white beauty, it's white good, it's white truth, it's all white. And the gospel offers us something else, I think. The gospel vision of reconciliation says, no matter what the color of your skin, you can become a servant like Jesus. You can love your neighbor as yourself. And I think our our challenge... Our challenge is to figure out how to embody reconciliation beyond multiculturalism in our ministries and our neighborhoods as the body of Christ in America. Thank you. Amen. I love it when I sit next to a white guy who says things like that. <laughs> I, I got enough other radical things to say. That's one down. Uh, my name is Juanita Irizarry, or Juanita Irizarry, whichever you can pronounce. Um, I am from Chicago, um, re- born and raised um, in the neighborhood of Humboldt Park and Logan Square, um, what, in what we call the inner city 
um, when I went off to my little Christian college in southern Illinois, they informed me that I was from the ghetto. And, uh, you know, I hadn't really thought about it that way, but that's where I'm from. Um, I have been, um, well, I was raised in a family uh, that is quite interesting. My the dad is Puerto Rican. My mom is a white lady who thinks she's Puerto Rican. <laughs> um, and um, definitely raised in a bicultural environment. And as a result, I really spent my life being a bridge person in many ways. Um, I went off to college and then came back to the same neighborhood where I was raised and where I have lived um, ever since, um, though I'm currently taking a hiatus to be uh, in graduate school in Boston. Um, my work life has been all about li living the things that I saw my parents live. Um, they were living the three hours before anyone had articulated to me what that was. Um, my parents both had master's degrees but chose to live in inner city Chicago as part of ministry through the church and through Christian schools and teaching um, and really just raised us that the safest place to be was in the center of God's will. And, and so that's just what it's, it's always been about. But I took a path that didn't involve full-time Christian ministry. It has involved working in community development in a secular environment and in public policy work uh, in a secular environment. But I found CCDA back in the early 90s and was just absolutely inspired to hear some people talking language that really was what everything was happening in my gut and in my heart, but I didn't have the words to articulate it. Um, so I... I, I I just harken back to those days of first reading John Perkins and first visiting Bethel New Life and the work of Lawndale Community Church and others like that, which have been a big part of my, um, my formation. By the same token, one of the challenges that I give to CCDA is how to involve individuals like me whose full-time job has never been in a paid Christian ministry or even full-time volunteer work in a Christian ministry. I've come to CCDA conferences for years. Um, I think my first one was in Baltimore, which was, I don't know, 94 or 95, um, and been coming ever since because I really love to be around a bunch of people who don't think I'm crazy. Um, but on the other hand, I've always felt like an outsider because I don't work in Christian community development. And I think that we, as a movement, really could could gain from having folks who work in secular jobs, who maybe have that high-paying job downtown, but choose to live in the ghetto, as, as I do, um, and really have them be part of that community making a difference. And, and I, I know that those folks are out there, but I don't know that CCDA speaks to them over the long term as well as we could. Um, you know, I've asked myself a number of years why I should pay my individual membership to CCDA. I send in my money because I care about CCDA, but the reality is we speak to those who want to go into full-time Christian ministry a lot of times more than we speak to those who just want to live in neighborhood and be racial, racial reconcilers, who want to live in neighborhood and be doing re redistribution by the virtue of the fact that they're there and how they love their neighbors, and speaking to those who care about relocation. Um, <laughs> So while I'm on the challenges, let me just mention a couple of other topics that may contribute to our dialogue without delving um, very far into them. Um, but another challenge for CCDA is to think about how to um, engage women in leadership uh, more fully. Um, I am a single divorced woman. I've been coming to these conferences for a long time, and what little focus has been on women has often been on how to be support to the women who are here supporting their husbands who are in full-time ministry. Um, and while I, while I believe that that is very important, and one of my best friends is a wife of a man in full-time ministry, and she's usually here with her four kids, and I help her babysit her kids so she can appreciate the conference, that's only one part of addressing uh, women. Some of us are the executive directors. Some of us are uh, in full-time ministry ourselves. I also appreciate how much over the years there are more Latino faces here, how there are more Asian faces here, more Native Americans, more recognition of all that, but I still don't see enough panels on racial reconciliation that look at it from other angles, from Latino angles, from Asian angles, etc. And a topic of, of particular interest to me personally, since the, the, the ghetto neighborhood that I live in is now very much gentrifying, is to talk about relocation when the place you're relocating to isn't exactly the ghetto anymore, and, and what that means in a gentrifying neighborhood, and how churches um, that are, I have a church walking distance from my house, Pastor Daniel Hill is here, most of the folks in his congregation are white folks. 
I live, you know, a few blocks away, go to another church within walking distance, and everybody in our church is Latino. How do we work together? How do we talk about relocation, redistribution, and racial reconciliation in that context? Finally, I, I do want to affirm, um, again, CCDA, it's where I've learned so much of what I know about community development, Christian community development, about social justice. I know that I met evangelical, Evangelicals for Social Action. I met Sojourners and Culture Renewal all here at CCDA, and I thank God for that. I thank God for what Kalila has already mentioned and the action that has been taken, and I just really encourage CCDA to keep moving in the direction of being more connected to broader public policy and social justice issues nationally. The work that we do in our communities is affected by decisions made at the government level. I personally am studying public policy right now, preparing for the calling that I believe um, God has laid out before me, which is to run for public office. Um, for a lot of people, thank you. For, for some people in my life, that means I'm going to be a Republican. Um, but to be honest with you, I'm a little bit embarrassed, actually quite embarrassed, to be aligned with the religious right in our country today, which is so often aligned with hate mongers and racists. That's not to say that the Democratic Party doesn't have all kinds of things messed up about it either. So my question for myself is how do I align myself and how do I be someone who's really looking for God's principles to be carried out, for, for us to be calling our government to looking for it to be stewards of the authority that God has set it up to be, not for us to be looking to be faithful Republicans or faithful Democrats. So I just pray that we as CCDA will continue to have those dialogues. We know when we come into the room we're not all in the same place politically, don't come with the same assumptions, but I'm proud that we've been having those conversations here and that we will continue to have them and we will also find ways to support people hopefully like me who want to be faithful representative of God's principles in the midst of this political reality in the U.S. I, that is rich. That's, that's almost enough to make me want to go vote. <laughs> uh, you know, let's give another big hand. There's, what a beautiful thing. You know, I think it's a true mark of humility to be able to be concise, and they each did so well. You can tell that there's a lot of depth uh, behind each of their stories and the wisdom that's there. So we're going to invite you to begin coming up to the two microphones here and add to the dialogue, add questions, share a little bit. We want to ask you also to have the humility to be concise, and we will also try to be concise in our, our responses. Um, but while you're doing that, I want to begin by inviting the panelists to uh, respond to each other and to begin to create a dialogue that we will then look to the microphones in just a second to move to. So. Well, I was going to say, that in, in response to Juanita's comments, um, one of the things that has surprised us in our work with the community and region in the Pacific Northwest is the amount of, uh, I think, Noel saw this when CCJ Institute came to our campus and to our community. The amount of mothers uh, who were participating in the institute surprised us. We thought we were going to get a lot of full-time pastors and uh, uh, bivocational pastors. We got a lot of lay leaders who were saying, equip us, though I work in the public schools, though I work in uh, a secular organization, equip us so we can do that work that we do on a full-time basis, and that was exciting. That was exciting. And I would like to also comment on what Tully was saying in reference to the youth. I believe one of the biggest downfalls is that a lot of people don't give youth the leadership opportunities that they need to voice their concerns. If a drug dealer or a gangbanger can give them the leadership opportunity to be a part of their streets and run their streets right. from 8 o'clock in the morning till literally 8 o'clock that next morning where they will be as committed to sleep, eat, use the bathroom, and do everything on that one particular corner only because someone gave them that leadership ability. Why can't we be leaders in God and Christ and do the same thing? And I think that's something very needed in our community. But also having roundtable discussions with them where we only facilitate, not moderate, not do anything else, but just really get them together to hear what they have to say. So many times we're talking at youth instead of with youth. 
and we miss the whole point. And I believe that that's one of the major things that we need to focus on. In reference to CCDA, uh, this is the first time that uh, we were made aware that this type of panel discussion was formulated, and I would like to see more of that, but with the actual teenagers and having them come up to say how their ministry through Christ has helped them to lead the way. Um, last night, if you missed the hip hop uh, concert, you really missed out because that was the place. That was the place where you got to see teenagers. I mean, the gentleman T. Wise came up and he talked about you know getting married and the, the beauty of that. And we normally don't see that portrayed on TV. We normally don't hear that portrayed in our ministries. So getting that connection, allowing youth to take that leadership ability, because if we don't give them that leadership ability, someone else will. Now, now something we now something we do we, we hear when we do these panels is that we don't leave enough time for, for questions and discussion. So you better jump up, you know. So we got like 15 minutes. Come on and line up by the microphones, and we're going to start uh, taking folks' responses. So okay, right here. Come on up. Whoever's ready. You ready over here, sir? Yeah, <clears throat> excuse me. Yes, sir. My name is Ted Hayes. I'm from Los Angeles, California. This is my first time coming to the CCDA conference. I'm an all-time associate of Mr. John Perkins. And um, I'm a homeless activist in Los Angeles. And I have an uh, organization called The Dome Village. It's the most advanced approach to homelessness in the modern Western world. Last night, I heard someone get on your platform and talked about the um, immigration issue and how supposedly those that uh, there's people here who are afraid of Mexican immigrants and so forth. Well, and the way it was put, it was like um, those of us who are against illegal uh, immigration that were bad guys. Um, we're not against illegal. We're not against immigration. We're against people crossing the border illegally. And it was kind of lopsided to discussion. And I would really appreciate it that if this organization is going to have open dialogue, that you should also have someone like me present the other side. Because see, as a black man and as a homeless activist, what I've come to realize in this last year or so that I cannot unmask get my people, homeless people, off the streets of America as long as our country is giving aid, attention, and resources to citizens of another country. Um, also, I recognize people say, you know, this, this country is made um, on the back of immigrants, and uh, it is a country of immigrants. And I go, duh. Not really, because um, this country was bu built on the back of West African black Chattel slaves. And then the immigrants came in on top of that. And what's really is disturbing me a lot about this is that, that people are coming in this country, whether they're from Mexico, Guatemala, Salvador, wherever they're from, uh, in Europe, Asia, they're saying they're here in the name of civil rights. There's a woman in Chicago right now, Alvara Arellano, who claims to be a, a, a um, um, Rosa Parks of the movement that is stealing my birthright, my heritage of my people. And I really would appreciate if this organization would dialogue about that a little bit more and include me in that discussion, please. Thank you very much. Um, I, I just want to say that the organization that I used to lead, Latinos United, found it really important to have dialogues between African Americans and Latinos, particularly on this issue, um, because it is a, a, a challenging issue, and I think it is something that we ought to have space for to talk about. Um, maybe there need to be more workshops um, within CCDA. I know in Chicago there are some folks that are trying to have these conversations within the community of faith so that we can all talk about the issues. I, I do want to agree that I think the legacy of slavery is a terrible thing in the U.S. and we have built this country on the backs of um, African slaves. I do want to correct historically, however, that um, the Spaniards who would be with Mexican slash Spaniards were in uh, New Mexico in 1604 before my family who came on the Mayflower and my mom's side got here in 1620. So actually um, a lot of folks have been here for a really long time. I think we need to reflect all of that history. We need to learn our own history, one another's history, and talk really about how we steward God's resources the way God would have us steward them. And my, my biggest argument is usually that as I read my Bible I'm not so sure that our God would have one country hoard all the resources in the world and then draw boundaries around it and tell people they can't come. Um, this is kind of a change of subject. Um, um, 
I am from Columbia, Missouri, and um, founder of a youth center that um, is Christian in essence, um, and have a particular sponsored church. And one of the things that I wanted to ask as a panel is um, just CCDA could re CCDA could really be helpful to us as a member organization because we are not controlled by any particular church, but we are Christian. And that is really hard in our town. The churches don't understand it. And I feel like as the founder and executive director that I stand between the secular world and the social world and the church world. And the church world's not happy because we're not demanding church attendance to be able to come to the center. It's encouraged but not demanded. And the social world is not happy because we focus on Christian values. And to stand in that place in the middle, CCDA is uniquely poised to be able to encourage and help. And I, I get so much out of being here. Um, this is my fifth year. And, um, and I just wanted to ask, you, you've mentioned some of, the, some of the issues, and I know that two of the workshops I went to this year dealt with power and transfer and perception of the world through the eyes of the church. And, and I've been really encouraged by that, but I wanted to ask for some comments about just say I thought that CCDA yeah. might be able to help with that, and do you have some comments on that? Thank you. Well, I, w I would encourage you to look to our Catholic brothers and sisters in terms of the orders of the church, where the Protestant church has not done a very good job with that, in my opinion. But the orders of the Catholic church have allowed that in-betweenness you talked about. Um, and I think there are a lot of people in here who represent that in-betweenness. Uh, I know I, um, I don't, sometimes I show up at church, I don't know where I am. Am, am I at the church? Am I, am I in order of the church? I, yeah. <laughs> and, and my wife is a director in, in World Vision, and she feels the same way as well. That at, and, and it's been our reflection on the orders of the Catholic Church that have helped us find a place within the Protestant Church to do our ministry, both within the church, but also in the secular marketplace, if you will. That's good from a Pentecostal, too. That's, that's, that's saying a lot. <laughs> I'll just say really quickly that the, the parachurch came out of a, a division that happened largely in Protestant Christianity that said that church is about uh, what you do on Sunday and what you believe in your heart. Um, I, I think that's just wrong. And, and we have to repent of that and find, find ways to correct it. So one of the ways is, is to just insist that what you're doing is church and, and try to find ways to connect with your local church on that. I've heard a, that's great. I've heard a lot of young leaders say we're not parachurch, we're pro-church. That's a great way of looking at it. Yeah, right over here. I have a question. Um, I'm from the quote-unquote iPod generation. <laughs> and how is the church going to not conform but address us that we can go on the internet, download a service, download a worship service and we don't actually have to come to a building and how do you address that if our money is going to that how do you address tithing to the physical two by fours and brick churches I think uh, Mary Wright said something very important yesterday she said that her generation didn't tell people to go to church the adults went with them to church so if an adult is saying it's okay to download worship service they need to be with you to find out if that's what you're actually downloading first and foremost but <laughs> and legally uh, so to say but also to instill that nothing can replace fellowship and I would also like to say that in reference to that you lose sense of connection it's great to get things fast but learning the benefit from patience by gratitude and what you get from that, that's something you can't get through a download. That would be my only word for that. Yeah, just touching on a little bit. What, what, uh, it's fun hearing where God's been working in y'all's life. Where, what resources, books, resources, experiences, maybe, would you encourage for people who are continuing to try to get down the road? on some of your particular areas that you guys have been involved with? I feel like when I come to CCDA, I, I get to hear from people who are farther down the road than I am. I'm always saying, how can I continue down this journey? Obviously, my experiences in the neighborhood are going to get me there. But any particular books or any particular experiences, maybe a trip somewhere or a... a, a um, 
a, a particular friendship or partic what ways have you guys used to get farther down the road? Um, I'll start and hopefully others have ideas in other genres. Since my thing is all about politics and public policy, um, I'll tell you the people I love to read. Um, anything by Jim Wallace, Sojourners, and Call to Renewal. Um, Jim Wallace's latest book, Odds Politics, which also has a companion study guide, is a very useful tool in thinking about how our Christianity should address politics in America. Um, Tony Campolo, who of course spoke uh, this week, is another great resource, and Ron Sider from Evangelicals for Social Action are three folks that I would recommend to read. Um, I, uh, although she gave a lot of reading materials, I'd say the resources are the people in your community. I learned more by listening to the older women on the 4700 block of West Adams and the you know 200 block of Hamlin than I can ever get from any book. And just hearing their stories from people who've been in the city 50 years and generation after generation, taking the time to sit with them, even if you've already been at work 13 hours, just that four-minute conversation, and it's amazing how many people have never asked them about their experience when they're the experts in the community. So I would definitely say, I would definitely say take the time to get to know the community. You may have some answers, but they have testimonies that you may not know how to address. So taking the time to listen to those community people. They're Amen. the ones who write the books without the paper and pen. And, and quickly, bef bef before um, before voting gets too far down the road in your community, I would suggest we all read the history of the biblical land and really uh, understand the Islamic perspective uh, better uh, than a lot may currently. Yeah, we're going to close with these two. Go ahead. Okay. Um, yes. In fact, what you just said um, has part to do with my question, and it's really out of ignorance. But as I was celebrating our diversity here this morning, I realized a huge gap or lack of Arabic or Middle Eastern people. And is it that they're just hard to reach, or what's the reason for their the lack of people of that culture not being there? It's just a uh, you know, one thing I can say too as a board member is we're, we're all trying to figure that out. And the CCDA is a family, you know, we're about, we're, you know, about relationships and communities. So I would say, you know, kind of back to you and to me, where are they? Let's bring them. Like, who, who, you know, that they're, people come here because they're friends with somebody, you know. And so let, let's always try to be reaching out and, uh, and inviting people to bring their perspective and their, their story into this community. So. Uh, my name is Carl. I'm the whitest white guy in Logan Square. Uh, <laughs> recently moved there. I, we're, I'm part of a church. It's a very young church. And as the, the neighborhood gentrifies, so does our church. And so we, we begin to talk about issues of race and how they relate to God's kingdom and community development. And when we mention even things like white privilege, lots of people who look like me start to leave. What's a way our church can address the integrated issues between community development race in God's kingdom and keep people like me. <laughs> well, uh, as, a, as the white guy up here, uh, <laughs> um, I, I don't think we can stay and, and stay the same. So um, some people will leave and um, I think more importantly is what are the people who stay learning? Uh, just to add to that perspective, I guess it's not much different than what he said, but I think we have some troubles where our, growth, our church growth models want us to have more people, but those people aren't very deep in their knowledge and understanding of the gospel. Um, so while we want to be able to have conversations that are respectful of one another, um, we also we also have to talk about what the Bible says. Um, so some people will leave, um, but but we have to have those hard conversations. I, I will say this: I I've stayed because people in our neighborhood have loved me. I think that's that's the other part. 
We're, we're going to close with, with something. Shame. I want to make sure you don't move for it. It's going to be really powerful. But Could I, ask I want to. Oh, we're going to. Okay. One more question. Okay. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. You're, you're um, I was I was born and raised in Napa Valley, California, a very affluential area. And something that I'm struggling with is the balance between. Um, economic poverty and spiritual poverty because Napa is spiritually in so much poverty and how you balance that is my question <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> I kind of feel like I should respond since Seattle is like the second richest city in the United States mm -hmm. <laughs> thanks to Bill Gates and um, Seattle is also experiencing spiritual poverty mm -hmm. and um, Washington is one of the most unchurched states yeah uh, in the United States and um, on Sunday morning people go play golf and <laughs> ski because and, yeah. they can afford to and uh, I was talking with uh, Dr. Uh, Louis Carlo before I came up here and uh, I think we need a great move of God I think we do and I think our intellect and our degrees won't matter at that level yeah. so true I, <laughs> I, 